Thank you for joining us on Public Square. And Danny, I'd like to start with you. Talk about when you were growing up. Did you have to hide the fact that you didn't read? Yes. How did you do that? One of the ways I would do it was to say I didn't have my glasses with me, because I need glasses in order to see. I should say to be able to read. <laughs> um, I would just come up with different excuses. And so you were, your parents were trying to homeschool you. Yeah. And that's why at some point they were trying to homeschool you, but they were deployed yeah. back and forth. So when you got into your teens, I mean, did they decide that when they I, just couldn't make it work anymore? When I hit about 15, 16 years old, they gave up because I was having a hard time with it. So they're just like, when you're ready to learn how to read, you will learn how to read. Okay. And I'm working with Read West right now. I've been going for six, seven months now, and my reading has improved. And what is that like to have that feeling that now you, you can actually do some reading on your own? Amazing. It's the best feeling in the world. What did it feel like before you could do that? Embarrassment, ashamed, humiliated. Did you have employers who knew that you couldn't read? One. What did they, so they were okay with that, or did yeah, they? Yeah, for the most part. They didn't, did they try to help you? No. Hmm. Can you talk about when you first made that decision to go get help? Went to a library and sat in the parking lot for a good, good hour, trying to get the courage to go in and ask for help, because I knew I needed the help and just too embarrassed and ashamed of it. Walked into the library after about an hour and asked the, one of the attendants there for a literacy class. They told me they didn't teach it. They gave me Redress's number and said if I call them that they either will be able to help me or point me in the right direction. They actually had me come in that day. You called them right away? It took me about 45 minutes to call them. <laughs> <laughs> to get up the courage to call them. Yeah. So do you have an idea of the first book that you want to read on your own? It's called um, A Fault in Our Stars. Okay. I've seen the movie. Mm -hmm. Great movie. I actually cried at the end. Yeah. So now I want to read the book. And I have it at home right now waiting for me. Muncie, how typical is Danny's story? Um, it's pretty typical. We have uh, people that come to our program. Um, I know that when they come through the door to ask for help, that they have had a struggle within themselves to decide I, this is something that I need. And I know that there's been a lot of courage uh, summed up before they walk through the door to ask for help. What is the goals that you set for the students? They, do they have to reach like a certain, is there a standardized test they take? Is there a proficiency level? Or? Um, when we come in, we have them tell us, what are, what are your goals? What are the things that you need reading for? So that's what the tutor will start with. Okay, let's write out what do you need to tell your, to write on this form. Um, and then they'll start with that as, as their literacy project that they're working on, their goal. Um, so that's usually, it's their personal goals is what they set and that's what we work towards. So that's, is that more effective to helping them stick with it? Right, that's okay. the motivator because it's something that they find useful right away. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't start at chapter one and go work through a book. We ask them, how can we help you today? What is it that you need? And it's usually something I want to help my child in school with, uh, she's got to write a book report and I don't know how to help her, so. Uh, Margaret, uh, the, the sort of coping mechanisms Danny described, is that, is that typical? What are people doing to hide the fact that they can't read or we, maybe not very well? Right, I'll tell you what some of our, our clients have done. We've had a client who at work had a tape recorder that he went around everything he had to do. He worked at a kitchen. He would tape record everything and then listen to it. Uh, a house painter who would only use one brand of paint 
because he had memorized the color chart and the names and would tell his customers, you have to use this brand of paint, not because it was maybe better, but because he knew the color charts. Uh, we had an individual who had to write reports for work. He had someone help him. When that person left, then he came to us for help because he needed it. A lot of people rely on their spouses. Um, but what's interesting is that studies have shown that of non-literate adults, two-thirds of them don't even tell their spouses they can't read and write. How can they hide that? Well, that's a really good question. Um, wow. To hide it within the family takes an incredible amount of, I didn't say skill, because yeah. I mean, you have to be able to rely on other people to do the reading and writing you have to do in a normal day, um, but then not tell them. And I could think of particularly one client we had, in fact, our first client in our program who came out to his family that he couldn't read. He was terrified of doing that. Um, and when he did it, his family was extremely supportive and it was a great relief to him. Um, but it, it takes incredible skill to, to get through our daily life without being able to read and write. In Bernalillo County, 16% um, of adults, and there are about, what, 471,000 adults living in Bernalillo County, can't read or write at all. Another 38% are functionally illiterate, and that is about third grade equivalency. So it's a huge part of our population that are struggling readers. In our program, last year of our basic literacy, which are reading and writing students, 74% were beginning readers, which is about uh, kindergarten to third grade equivalency. None of our students have skills coming into the program greater than eighth grade. So this, they aren't even ready to go into like a GED no, program? No, not at all. And they're not ready to go into adult basic education programs at the community college. Um, and that is one reason why re what Read West does and what Reading Works does is so important because there's no other place for these people to go. What are the challenges to reaching people who need this help? There's a lot of challenges, I, and I want to follow up with something Margaret just said, you know, that with the programs that we have uh, in the county and, and even with Reed West, if you think about it, we're able to serve with all of those programs hundreds of people, and the need is thousands of people, right? So that we're nowhere near matching the need that's out there. So one of the things we first tried was going door to door and asking people, you know, if you want this help, here's the phone number. Uh, the difficult challenge in that was to create a flyer that says, if you can't read, please call <laughs> yes. this number. Yeah, um, how do you do that? <laughs> so, you know, so we worked with um, Reading Works to, to get a flyer in as basic uh, English as we could get it. If we went out and told people there were these programs, because many people don't know there are th these programs, they would be very backed up very quickly. So we've stopped doing that because we don't want to create a waiting list because that discourages people. Oh, wow. So we've been working and trying to figure out how do we get more capacity for adult education, for basic literacy, for ESL. So what's the impact? Right, the impact is huge. It, whether you can get a job, right? The l number of people who can't apply for the average job because of their literacy is huge. So we count on bringing people from out of state instead of developing the people that we have here, right? And that, so that continues to move this and that's it, that forward. People can't help their children with their homework, right? Which so impacts the kids. Guarantees that that next generation of children uh, doesn't quite make it as, as far as they could have. Somebody who graduates high school um, is less likely to be incarcerated than someone who doesn't. The people who get GEDs while they're incarcerated are less likely to go back. So it impacts how much money we spend on public safety. Um, it impacts public safety in general, right? If people can read, mm -hmm. um, they know how to follow signs, they, they follow directions. If they have multiple medications, you know, they're taking, they have a better chance of taking them correctly. 
So it impacts lots of things, and it impacts family dynamics, right? If you're an adult and you can't read, you're not going to know what the flyer says when the school sends it and says, come and participate in your child's education. I, I want to ask Jose, um, you are working with adult learners who maybe not, uh, in, maybe in literacy, maybe they're going for their GED. So what drives them to find these resources? Why are they coming to you? One of the big ones, as Enrique was indicating, was um, how do I help my kids? How do I help my children? I feel ashamed that I cannot even help them, okay? Uh, um, so I need to look for, or they need to look for uh, a program where they can get those skills to improve that kind of education in the family. And then after that, uh, probably going into higher education, community college, university. We have stories about uh, mm, wonderful people getting into the programs. They came as an immigrants. Um, many of them, they didn't finish elementary school in Mexico and any other Latino American countries. And, and they go through uh, these programs and they, they succeed. And what are the uh, sort of the challenges to them doing that, realizing their goals? We could say work schedules, uh, taking also into account that uh, most of the population we have in our classes are single moms. Mm -hmm. Mothers, single moms, and women, mm, they probably con conform uh, about 90-something percent of the population. So they've already got a lot on we, we their plate. We have a lot. <laughs> okay. okay. Many of, of the students, the moms that are in the, in the, in the classes, uh, we can talk about that and we say, okay, mm, okay women, I kind of have more courage. <laughs> yes, they are coming <laughs> to the class. Do the children come with them or do they have, do you have child care? Mm, many times we, have, we, we see children in, in mm -hmm. classes and um, uh, because moms uh, have a difficult, uh, difficult um, you know, time finding uh, child care, as we were saying, child care is one of the big issues right here. Right. Yeah. Leah, I know the program you have at APS, the idea is to integrate the children and the parents sort of together to meet their needs. Well, and even start family literacy. We um, contract with Catholic Charities and the teachers come and they teach GED and ESL um, at our sites. We have 12 sites in Albuquerque, but the children get preschool and parents want to put their children in preschool, especially if they have difficulty with reading or don't have their diploma or are struggling. They want their children to get started as soon as possible. And this is a free preschool, but the children aren't, it's not a first come first serve program. It's a, there's a qualification process. They have to put in an application and there's a priority list. And we take the parents first who are struggling just being able to read. If, if, if they need a tutor, we will find them a tutor. And maybe I need to hook up with some of you to uh, get tutors, but there are different, many, many different resources for tutors. And the Catholic Charities Adult Ed teachers help us connect with different tutors. So we may already be having some of our, some of the adults may already be getting some basic tutoring. But that's the highest priority. Those families that come to put their child into preschool and have a really high literacy need, they're the first ones that we take. Is that a way to, we're talking about it's hard to get people sometimes. You know, Danny talked about waiting like an hour like in the bit. parking lot. Yeah. I mean, is that a way even for the people who have kids um, to get at that sort of shame and stigma? I think everybody wants to do the very best thing they possibly can for their child. They don't always know what that is. I've never seen, I've never met a parent who didn't care about their child. Even if there was some real big problems, they all care about their children. And if they need to put in a little bit of sacrifice and go to school, and I have the best staff ever. The, this is one of the best programs that APS has and our city has. And they talk with the parents, you know, and they tell them, if you want your child to have this quality preschool, you need to go to school. And while you go to school, we'll provide you child care. So you might have multi-generations of people who didn't have these literacy skills. Yes, wow. and, and a string of preschoolers that go through the program. And before you know it, we know the whole family, the community comes together. They network with each other because they meet each other in ESL class. They also are required to go to parenting classes to participate. So one of the great, pro we have so many wonderful agencies here in Albuquerque. The Albuquerque Public Schools, whether it's in the county or the city, they have a program, it's called uh, Every Child Ready to Read. Mm -hmm. And they will come out and they bring books 
for every, one for every family. And they will work with just the adults. And they will teach them dialogic reading skills. How do you read to your child? Sometimes you read from cover to cover. Sometimes you ask the child to tell you what you think is going to happen. Sometimes you ask them deeper questions about why do you think this is happening? You know, and they teach them how to hold the child on their lap, how to read to them. They give them, the, they practice with that book that they're giving everybody. Then they give every family that book. And then they give them a packet of books for their child's age level. And it's all free. It's all free. Is this, so uh, the need seems tremendous. It's I mean, huge. beyond the international district, just here and in our state, do we have enough capacity? I mean, I'm assuming well, that you can't take everyone. We comes. can't. <laughs> we have 12 sites, and we have grown. 25 years ago, we had one site. Our board and our upper administration value our program because we've had many, many graduates. Because the language development for the child, because we serve three and four-year-olds, but also for the adults, the language development, you see the vocabulary, uh, sometimes bilingualism. It, it's just amazing, and, it's, and it, it keeps everybody going, you know. Are you, have you tracked the impact on the kids? Are the kids doing better in school? Well, just anecdotally, I'll tell you, I have been invited to many high school graduations mm -hmm. for these families, and they're the first children that have graduated from a long line of generations. What I've seen when you work with the adults and help them with their literacy, as well as the child, the very young child just starting school. Um, I've seen mothers who had older children and this was their baby. The older children didn't get that same help, but mom was brought in, and we also embrace them, bring them into the school, help them get parenting classes, help them become involved in, in, and network with the other parents. I've seen moms suddenly become treasurer of the um, PTA, and then when they go to middle school, pretty soon they're involved there. And I've seen parents stay involved all the way to the high school level. Well, I, you know, it brings up a good point, because uh, Roberta, I wanted to ask you, you got your high school degree, but then you, you went back at 29, 30, 30 for yeah. your associate's degree? I did. Why? <laughs> um, so I was a young mom. I had my first daughter when I was 20 years old. And, you know, I just never saw college as an option for me. And as they were getting Were your parents they, didn't have a college No, no, okay. I'm the first in my family and even more of my extended family to graduate from college. And so um, I was working for an attorney at the time and um, you know, I was just seeing people around me starting to go back to school and, and seeing that influence. And for me, uh, I was on my own since I was about 16 years old. And so being a parent was extremely important to, to, to just be a good parent. And I didn't know what that was. And so, I worked really hard on, on pushing education for them, reading to them when they were young, just spending all my time with them and you know, taking them to libraries and taking them to all these different groups and stuff like that so they could have what I didn't have and, and expose them to, to the resources within the community as best as I could. Um, and so when my youngest daughter was going into kindergarten, I just figured, you know, if I don't do something for myself, what am I really showing them? And so I wanted to make sure that they had a good foundation. And so I talked with my husband and I just, we made the decision together for me to go back to school. So like you, I sat at the, it was TVI. I sat in the parking lot. Oh, it's parking CNM lot. used to be yeah, TVI. C mm -hmm. Yeah, CNM used to be TVI and I sat in the parking lot probably for about 45 minutes. Really? Yeah, I was terrified. I was terrified to go into school with what I thought was just gonna be a bunch of, you know, young students and um, just didn't know where I was gonna fit and how I was gonna be able to learn how to study again and you know will I be successful and now it wasn't just about me it was about being successful for them exactly. so that was a huge difference for me um, that really made an impact and so I finally got the courage to walk in that classroom and and get started you got associate's degree you got a BA you got a master's mm -hmm. degree I did. I did and now you work at CNM I do <laughs> it's like a full I always say it's a full circle of life you know it just it's it's such a wonderful experience to be able to struggle going back to school and, and trying to figure out how, how, what my path was going to take and then going to transferring from TBI to, to UNM and then working at the university really exposed me to not only to appreciate my education but fall in love with education. What impact did it have on your daughters? I think the impact has been huge. Um, you know, when, we, when they were little, we would just study together. We would make dinner together and then go clear off the table and we'd do our homework together. Um, I think I was telling you that I would go to Frontier and that was our, our special day because I'd, I'd say, okay, you know, we're going to do our homework, but you can't do a treat. And so we'd go to Frontier and, and just exposing them kind of to that, that 
um, environment and they would see other people there, groups of, of students studying and, and so they were always exposed to it. Um, my youngest daughter decided to go to um, school as a nurse during high school. So she graduated high school, not only with her high school diploma, but her LPN. Wow. And that's huge. Mm -hmm. and I, I so she did a dual enrollment. She did. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, um, it was such an incredible thing to see her grow that way and, and to, to be so focused. But I don't think if I would have went back to school, I mean, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. she would have. But I think if I wouldn't have been back to school and wouldn't have kind of made education such a priority in our life, um, I don't know if they would have taken the same paths. I think there's the stories that have been shared here show something really important of one, how much people know they want to go back and yet how scary that is. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, uh, part of the stigma is people don't want to go back to school, people don't want to learn how to read, people don't want to learn English, you know, whatever the stereotypes that people have. Mm -hmm. But yet we've just heard two stories of people who had to face an, an incredible amount of fear and work through that to get just to, to make the call and get started on top of the other barriers like transportation or childcare or all of these things, right? And so I think it's important to recognize that um, it's not that people don't want to learn how to read or don't want to go back to school. They do. Or it's just care. what do we do to support that? Well, we're going to keep talking about this in the next part of our show, so just sit tight and we'll bring in some more of our leadership and talk about that. Yes, no, no.